Good morning, Well Spring Bible Fellowship. It's so good to see you guys here this morning. Let's stand up as we uh, prepare our hearts to sing to our great and awesome God. I think of the scripture says, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. And I hope you're uh, thrilled to be here this morning, ready to worship our God. Let's worship him. And he turned me around and he placed my feet on a solid ground. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He picked me up and he turned me around and he placed my feet on a solid ground. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He picked me up and he turned me around and he placed my feet on a solid ground. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Cause he's been so good, so, so good to me So good, so, so good to me So good, so, so good to me, Jesus He's been so good, so, so good to me So good, so, so good to me So good, so, so good to me, Jesus I've got love, joy, and peace, and righteousness In the Holy Spirit Whoa, oh, oh, yeah Whoa, I've got love, joy, and peace, and righteousness in the Holy Spirit. Whoa, yeah, sing it out. Cause he's been so good, so, so good to me. So good, so, so good to me. So good, so, so good to me, Jesus. He's been so good, so, so good to me. So good, so, so good to me. So good, so, so good to me, Jesus. Lord, we're so grateful this morning to be here, and we, we are so grateful that you picked us up and you turned us around, Lord, and that you uh, have placed our feet on a rock, Lord, that you've lifted us up out of the miry clay, as it says in Psalm 40, and uh, you've given us a foundation, a place to stand uh, on Jesus Christ, the solid rock. That's where we stand today. Thank you, Father, that you've given us a foundation that's not shifting and and turning, but you've given us a a rock that we can count on, that we depend on. And, uh, Lord, I pray that today, 
that you will grow us, uh, that you'll give us uh, our, our feet a footing on you. Lord, even as we get into your word, as we sing to you, as we fellowship with each other, God, may you be glorified in all that's said and done in this place today, Lord. We pray this in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. 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 It's so good to see you. Why don't you take just a minute and love on each other this morning. It's so good to have you here this morning. Let's stand up as we keep singing to our God this morning.
grace and fill the atmosphere. Your glory, God, is what our hearts long for, to be overcome by your presence, Lord. Amen. Oh, for a thousand to sing my great Redeemer's praise, the glories of my God and King, the triumphs of His grace. My gracious Master and my God, assist me to proclaim, to spread through all the earth abroad the honors of Thy Sing out, let our anthem grow loud. There is one great love. So come on and sing out, let our anthem grow loud. There is one great love, Jesus. Just the name that charms our fears, that bids our sorrow cease. Tis music in the sinner's ears, tis life and help and peace. He breaks the power of canceled sin, he sets the prisoner free. His blood can make the foulest clean, his blood availed for me. So come on and sing out, let our anthem go loud. There is one great love. So come on and sing out, let our anthem go loud. There is one great love, Jesus. Speaks and listening to his voice, new life the dead receive. The mournful broken hearts rejoice, the humble poor believe. Glory to God and praise and love be ever, ever give. By saints below and saints above, the church in earth and so come on and sing out, let our anthem grow loud. There is one great love. So come on and sing out, let our anthem grow loud. There is one great love. There is one. Lord, we thank you for your name, the name of Jesus that is given to uh, men whereby we might be saved. Thank you, Lord, for coming uh, to this earth. Thank you for living a, lo a perfect, holy life and for uh, dying for us, uh, Lord, for the power that you uh, showed by raising from the dead. Lord, it's because you are alive and seated at the right hand of the Father today that we are here gathered to worship you. You alone are worthy of our praise. There's no one else that has overcome death like you and who lives on high and, and is uh, eternal uh, in the heavens, God. We just love you. We worship you today. We thank you that uh, because of the life that you lived, that you offer us eternal life. We praise you today, Lord. We, we are uh, grateful for the new life that you've given to us. God, help us to live it for you. Uh, help us to live out uh, magnifying your great name, the beautiful name of Jesus Christ. 
There's one great love, Jesus. Help our, our love to be, uh, our greatest love to be for you, Lord. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. Thank you that uh, that you are high and lifted up. Thank you that you 
have uh, have given us eternal life, Lord, and that you've given us your word now that we can look to and uh, and grow st- stronger and stronger in you. Lord, I pray that, that uh, you, the meat of your word today will feed us, Lord, it will sustain us, that we will grow, that we'll be nourished, and that we will go from this place and live it out. Grow us today, we pray, Lord, and we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You can be seated. I didn't see anything. <laughs> I saw nothing. <laughs> no, it doesn't remind me of anybody at all. <laughs> well, I was about to say, <laughs> uh, no, I just, you know, it's, I love that song, uh, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain for us. And that really fits in well with our title because uh, on your bulletins, you'll see that Oh, that's right. We don't have bulletins this morning. So maybe you know, maybe you don't, but today we're going to be adding to our our whiteboard of our identity in Christ. And today we are adding this really cool concept. This is great. You're going to love this. Check it out. You ready? You ready? Tell me you're ready. You are forgiven. Right? How cool is that? Because I don't know about you, but growing up, I did this one time, I did this thing that was wrong. And I was forgiven, and I thought to myself, self, this is good. I like being forgiven. Now, there was these other times I did things that were wrong, and I wasn't necessarily forgiven. I was held accountable. And I said to myself, self, I like forgiveness way better than being held accountable. So I know that there are note takers out there, and I know that you got no notes because, you know, we don't got a bulletin because the printer don't work. So I do have some pieces of paper, and if there are note takers that would like to be able to take some notes, and if I could get a couple guys to help hand those out, that would be most grooviest. Where did you go to school? <laughs> South Umgua, baby. <laughs> there's a couple over there that got some. There you go. And there's, or we can make some more on the cutting block if those all go away. So if you want to hold up your hand, if you're a note taker, then uh, we'll get you a piece of paper that you can take some notes on. Uh, Also, maybe hopefully I'll talk with the office staff, and if you are are on our email address, I'll see if we can get an email that is get sent out this week with the taking it deeper notes for you. Uh, This would be another great encouragement for you to fill out your connect card with your email address. So if you haven't done that, see, there's another plug for the connect card. We don't even need a connect card to be able to plug the connect card. We've got some. All right, so yeah, make sure you've got your email address on file with the church so that we can get important notices to you because we do that for prayer requests and emergency prayer requests, special needs, and information that goes out. Uh, Let us pray, and then uh, keep those hands up if you are wanting a piece of paper for notes, but I'll pray to get us going here. Lord, as we come to you today, we are just so thankful for forgiveness. Oh my goodness, Lord, what a blessing it is that we realize that we are the ones that, uh, that have done things that disappoint you. Lord, we are the ones who have done things that go, quite honestly, against your will. They dishonor you, they disrespect you, and they break your heart. And Lord, yet you and your great love and compassion, being the creator of all things, look down from your high places upon us and are willing to forgive us if we will just come to you in faith and ask for it. What a blessing. What a great position we have to be under you as your people, Lord, to be your people and for you to be our God. We thank you for this and look forward to your study in your word. Lord, just open our eyes, ears, and hearts to hear a message from you, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. So we're going to be in Ephesians 4, verses 25 through 32. Uh, we're going to read through these uh, and then kind of get an idea of maybe where we're going. What does it mean to be forgiven? And if you've been forgiven, I mean, what does that look like? I mean, that, if, if you've been forgiven, it should have an impact on your life just a little bit. And we're going to talk more about that. But we want to get some, uh, some meat on the bones here from Ephesians 4, verses 25 through 32. Paul, writing to the church in Ephesus, tells them, and therefore us also, therefore, laying aside falsehood, Speak truth to each other, to, uh, speak truth each one of you with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. Be angry and yet do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger, and do not give the devil an opportunity. He who steals must steal no longer, but rather he must labor, performing with his own hands what is good, so that he will have something to share with one who has need. 
Let no unwholesome word proceed from your mouth, but only such a word as is good for edification, according to the need of the moment, so that it will give grace to those who hear. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving each other, just as God in Christ has forgiven you. Simple, right? So what I want you to do is I want you to think about that verse and maybe kind of through, uh, throughout the day, the week, the rest of your life, uh, read through that and ask yourself, how am I doing? Am, am I living like a forgiven person? Am I living like somebody that would identify with Christ or that somebody might look at me and say, wow, that person must be a follower of Jesus Christ. And how do we know? Well, we look at so many different uh, texts that we have that kind of outline for us what the life of a Christ follower looks like. And we look at this and we say to ourselves, wow, that's so not me. <laughs> I still have much work to do, and we try, and I think we do pretty good most days, but we understand that we don't do well every day, not in every moment. And that's why we not only are so thankful for the forgiveness that we have received for our transgressions, our wrongful deeds in the past, but we're also so thankful that we can continue to come to the Lord and recognize, as he does, that we still get it wrong from time to time, day to day. And so we can still come to him and ask for forgiveness. So what does it truly mean to be forgiven? Well, the first thing is, is that we have to admit that we've done something wrong. Now, I've spent a lot of time working, as you know, with corrections and law enforcement. And now here's something kind of cool. I get to now introduce myself officially as your preaching pastor. And I am, <laughs> thank you. I have got to say the affirmation from this body has just been amazing. And I appreciate you all so much. Uh, and I look forward to what we're gonna do in the future. I really do. Uh, and one of those things, I hope, is that we are going to continue to grow into this identity in Christ. And I say we because I understand that we all got a long ways to go. And one of those things, as we need to understand, is that we don't always get it right. For those of you who have raised children, uh, maybe a grandchild, great-grandchild, great-great-great-grandchild, somewhere in the line, you know that, that you, sometimes you're like, okay, so who got into the cookie jar? Okay, and, and the typical answer for who got into the cookie jar was this, remember? Not me. Not me. Not me, whoever or wherever not me is, is one bad kid. <laughs> so one of the things that we need to, at some point, we need to get our heads around, our hearts around, our, our, our reality around, is that sometimes not me is me. Sometimes I am me. Sometimes I am the one that does those things that God says I should not be doing. I know I'm certainly the one that did those things that God said I should not be doing at one time, which is why I'm so thankful for forgiveness. But we have to admit that we have done something wrong. And not just something wrong, but something that truly is worthy of punishment. Because we always have this idea too, that, you know, that maybe it's not, you know, well, it was bad, but it wasn't real bad. Well, R.C. Sproul, uh, he wrote this, he's a Christian author. He said, every sin is an act of cosmic treason, a futile attempt to dethrone God in his sovereign so authority. Have you ever thought of your sin that way? Every time, I mean, put it in that context of being a cosmic treason. When we rebel so hard against the authority of God and we say to ourselves, well, I'm just going to do it my way. And I love this little quote here. I'm not stubborn. My way is just better. We get that attitude sometimes. Like, well, I understand what God says and I understand how God you know, dealt with it. You know, but that was way back in the Old Testament and we're in New Testament. So that doesn't apply to us anymore, Right. Or it was written in the New Testament, but it was written a long time ago. And this is a different world. I mean, they didn't have internet back then. They didn't have cars. They didn't have all the stuff that we've got. They didn't have all the problems that we have now. We've got it so much harder. So now we get to reinterpret some of this because our way is obviously going to be better. And it's not. And it leads us down a path of doing things our way instead of his way. In our pride, we, we, we are in essence saying, when we choose to go against the will of God, when we choose to put our will in front of God's will, in our pride, we are in essence saying, I am greater than God. In our arrogance, I am saying, my will is greater and stronger than God's will. And we're saying, my will be done, not God's will be done. In essence, when you think about it, isn't that really what we are doing? And so you can understand why R.C. Sproul wrote that it is like cosmic treason. 
in a futile attempt, we are trying to dethrone God and his sovereign authority. There is no higher authority than God's word. There is no higher authority than God. There is no greater authority than his will. And so when we choose, and it is a choice, to do it our way instead of his way, then we are rebelling against God. You thought only Lucifer thought that way. (laughs) And yet here we are, in our pride and arrogance, fighting against these things. Praise God that he loved us so much that he sent the son to die on the cross for our sin. Because of our arrogance and pride, there was no other way that this problem was going going to be solved. There was no other way that we could be forgiven for the transgressions, for the acts of aggression that we have made against the Lord. Amen. Understand this, God's wrath is just and it's justified. And he pours that wrath out on the unrighteous. He pours that wrath out on those who choose to rebel against him, who choose their will over his will. And God hates sin and he hates everything that there is to do with sin. There's a couple different uh, chapters talking about these, these lists of things that God hates. Well, let me summarize it for you. God hates it when people reject him. God hates it when people rebel against him. God hates it when people turn to their will and turn to their own ways and ignore him. Know that this greatest commandment that we find in about three or four different places in God's word, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. Wasn't that the greatest commandment? When the Pharisees came to Jesus and they said, well, what is the greatest commandment? He said, it's this, as you've been told in the Old Testament, as you know to be true, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. So when I choose to walk my own way, when I choose to rebel against God's will and do it my way, when I make that choice, am I obeying the greatest commandment? The answer is no. In our pride, we rebel and we reject God when we do this. We turn our back on him. God's word says he likens it unto adultery, where we choose the lust of the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of our will over his will. And God hates that. He hates it because it separates us from him. But God's hate is much different than our hate. His anger is a lot different than our anger. And his wrath is a lot different than our wrath. Because when we have anger, when when we have wrath, we do it and we're vindictive about it, right? It's like, okay, you wronged me. Oh, I am getting back at you. You crossed me, okay, all right, I remember that, Mm mm-hmm. That's the way we do wrath and anger. God doesn't do anger and wrath that way. It's not payback when it comes to God. God's wrath comes from the truth of understanding that the unholy and the unrighteous in their character and their nature will not and cannot exist in the presence of God in heaven. God's goodness, God's righteousness, God's light is so bright and so pure that sin cannot exist in heaven. And so the unrighteous have no part in heaven. And God hates that, that there are some who would choose to rebel and walk away from him, to reject him, to forsake forgiveness and choose to walk in their own path of sinfulness and be separated from him. God hates that. So then in his anger, in his righteous indignation, as it's sometimes called, he pours out his wrath on those who reject his truth, those who reject his love, those who reject his forgiveness and reject his holiness. They bring that wrath on themselves. For in their pride and their arrogance, they remain unforgiven and therefore unholy, and therefore unable to arrive in heaven. Did you know that God's word actually references God's anger, his wrath, his judgment, more frequently than it talks about his love, grace, and mercy? I think there's a reason for that. I think God wants us to understand how very serious this is. And here's the thing, if you know people out there that have not accepted the message of the gospel yet, More often than not, when you talk to them, they really just don't take these things seriously. 
It's like they don't believe it will happen or it's something to take care of somewhere, someday, but they're just not taking these things seriously. And God wants us to take this very seriously because life, death, and eternity are at stake. Well, if God's taking it that seriously, then guess what? We ought to be taking it that seriously also. God wants us to have knowledge of this. He wants us to have wisdom regarding this. He wants us to understand this. Proverbs 1.7 tells us the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. Proverbs 9.10 says it again, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and the knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. God says, I want you guys to understand this. To know the Lord is to understand his authority, his power, and his might. And that should give us a little bit of fear. Not necessarily always in the idea of being scared of God, but certainly having great respect for God. But then again, this is the same God who can bring us into heaven or by your decision to to reject him and rebel against him, to deny him, allow you to pass away from him into a place of separation. He's the same God that can bring about forgiveness. He's the same God that can bring about wrath. So there's something to be said for having fear for God. Maybe, just maybe, when you got home from, from, uh, from school and you knew that you had done something bad at school and you knew that the office had called home to mom and dad, maybe, just maybe, you were waiting for dad to get home and you just had a little bit of fear in your heart. Because in that fear and that knowledge, you knew that because of your actions, wrath was coming. Is that unhealthy? No, because maybe it's an encouragement for us to do better. When our lives and we have rejected and rebelled and turned away from God to our own paths, and we understand that God is the same God that brings about wrath as the same God that brings about forgiveness and mercy, if I've brought that wrath down on myself, then maybe it's an encouragement for me to do better. God wants us to have knowledge and understanding. He wants us to take the knowledge that we find in God's word and to apply it. There's a, I, I think there's a reason why these are two different words that are used up here. Okay? Knowledge is just learning. Okay? We give lots of learning. I, I can tell you, in all the years that I've been with Wellspring Bible Fellowship, we do learning good. Now the question is, what are we going to do with all that learning? What are we going to do with all that knowledge? Because when you apply knowledge and the knowledge becomes works and becomes action, that's called wisdom. I know some very intelligent people that are not very wise. If you have all the learning and you're not applying it to the life around you, that's not smart. God says, I've given you all this knowledge. I want you to apply it to your lives. Let it be wisdom to you to make good choices and to guide your path and your decisions. The wisest of all kings ever met, King Solomon. Solomon said, you know, Lord, I just want to have great wisdom. God said, all right, that's what you want, you get it. Solomon wrote this, he said, in the conclusion, when all has been heard, know this, fear God and keep his commandments. Smartest fellow ever lived, told us this, fear God and keep his commandments. And he wasn't the only one. We find that throughout scripture, that idea of fearing God and keeping his commandments. Why? Because this is good for you. I can make this real simple. Disobey God, get in trouble. Obey God, get reward. Is anyone confused? Now, I think y'all get it pretty good, but the world out there still hasn't heard this message and they're not believing it and they're not taking it seriously. They still think that they can disobey God and walk their own path and not have any consequences. Ah, it's not gonna matter. Yes, it is. It is. Solomon said, fear God and keep his commandments because this applies to every person. For God will bring every act to judgment, everything which is hidden, whether it is good or evil. You see, when we separate ourselves from the path of lawless, uh, from lawfulness, and we start walking down our own path, we wind up breaking the law. I know that you know what it feels like, some of you, when you break the law. Not all of you, but some of you, because there's a lot of police officers in this area, and those lights are really distinctive, and so are your cars. <laughs> when we break the law, 
We may not agree with the consequences that come with that, but we know they exist. And it doesn't matter whether you agree with the consequences. It doesn't matter whether you think they're just or unjust. The fact of the matter is, if you drive 75 in a school zone, now I'm not saying anybody here did that. Quit looking around at each other. (laughs) But if you were to do so, you know that there would be consequences. And whether you agree with the consequences or not is not the point, is it? It's that you know that the consequences are there. And so if you choose to break the law, you know that if you are caught and held accountable, there's going to be a price to pay. We understand that. If you choose to rebel against the law, there will be consequences. We don't like talking about punishment. Lukewarm churches don't like talking about punishment. In fact, they hardly ever do. Or if they do, it's just in casual, it's just in passing. I mean, isn't it so much more comfortable to talk about God's love and God's forgiveness and God's grace and God's mercy? That's cool. We like talking about that. Oh, by the way, when we disobey God and we turn away from God and we walk our own ways, there might be affliction that comes into your life. Oh, by the way, for that friend of yours out there, that family member of yours out there who has not accepted Jesus Christ as their personal savior, if they get hit by a bus today, this afternoon and die, they will not know heaven. We don't like talking about that. We don't like talking about wrath. We like talking about how God rescues us, and he does. And we will talk about those things. But God hates sin. He's not fond of watered-down teachings either. And so we will avoid sin, and we will speak out against sin, and we will not give watered-down teachings in this church. Somebody's got to take a stand. Somebody has to take a stand in this world that is spinning into chaos. The Lord said of the lukewarm church, he's, I'll spit you out of my mouth. The world is spitting the word of God out of its mouth. Who's going to take a stand? I can tell you from church leadership down, we desire to make a stand. We're asking everybody hearing the, this message here today and they're at home hearing our messages online, we're asking you to take a stand. If every one of us, what an amazing thing this would look like if every person sitting here today, I want you all to look around, somebody sitting next to you. Look around, look around, everybody looking around. Look around, look around, look around, look around, look around, everybody look around. What would it look like if every one of us decided to take a stand? and say, you know what, I will not stand for the lies of the world. I will stand for the truth of Jesus Christ. I will not stand by and do nothing while my friends, my neighbors, the people that I interact with daily on the street are separated from God from all eternity because I chose or refused to do anything about it. What if we all took a stand and decided to share the gospel of Jesus Christ? What if we all took a stand and decided to live like we were followers of Jesus Christ publicly? So that there was no doubt in anybody's mind, to anybody that knew you, that you were a follower of Jesus Christ. Not just because they saw it in your life, but because they had heard it from your mouth. What would that look like? Ephesians 5, 6, the Apostle Paul told us this, Let no one deceive you with empty words. For because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Paul had been talking about rebellious lives. He'd been talking about unjust and immoral acts. And he had told them and warned them that judgment was coming. He said, don't be deceived with empty words. Don't be deceived with lukewarm messages. There's one truth out there and it's God's word. And God loves us. He sent the son to die on the cross for us. And all who call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. That is truth. But it is also just as true that God's wrath is coming for all who reject and rebel against him. And we have to understand that and take it to be truth as well. What about those who refuse to accept God in this respect that God is? You know, I just just don't believe all that stuff. Is ignorance truly bliss? No. Now, Romans 1, if you get get a chance this afternoon, you can go through and read it. God is, and we know God is, because when we walk outside the walls of this church, we see that God is in everything we look at. 
As I look at newborn babies, I can say there is no doubt that God is. As I look up in the heavens at night, I can say there is no doubt that God is. When I look at my own self, I say to myself, there is no doubt that God is. And he has a sense of humor. <laughs> Someone might say, you know what? This God of yours sounds like a bully. I mean, it's his way or the highway. I mean, it's love me or no eternal death and destruction. Oh, your God's a bully. No, God is love. And that is why God created us with the very ability to have a relationship with him. God's not a bully, God is love. You don't see the ants, the fish, the birds having the kind of relationship with God that we do. He created us special and unique. You don't see anywhere else in all that God created an opportunity to know Jesus. You don't see him coming to die on the cross to pay the sins of, uh, for, for anything else, not even the angels in heaven. We are loved and unique beyond everything else that God created. God is love, God is not a bully. God opened the door of salvation to all who would call upon the name of the Lord. God's not a bully. God's love. To any who would say that God is not, and I choose not to believe in God, God's not a bully. You are arrogant. You are prideful. That's why God sent his son to die on the cross for our sins, is because he is love, and because we are so special in his eyes. There's this verse you might have heard. It kind of rolls through every once in a while. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son so that whoever believes in him would not perish but have everlasting life, eternal life. Remember a couple lessons ago, we were talking about the problem with sin. It's like, it's like that scale of righteousness. God created us good. All things were good in the beginning, and then we chose to sin. Adam and Eve chose to sin, and the weight of that sin put unrighteousness on our side of the scale. That was our choice. We put it there. God didn't create us with sin. He didn't create it, but he did create us with the ability to choose to do good or to do evil. And from the very first human on earth, we chose evil. And so did we. Not every time, not all the time, but we did choose to do evil in our own selves. And that one act in our life added to the equation the unrighteousness of our life. It added rebellion into our life. It added sin into our life. And if it added that sin to our life, then we know that we cannot be in heaven with that sin because sin has no place in heaven. That one act. We still look at people and go, well, look at that guy over there. He's like really bad. That guy's a big sinner. I'm nowhere near a sinner as that. Sin is in a sliding curve. How many sins does it take to, to, to cast us out of God's presence? One sin. One sin. That one sin fly in the soup bowl of our life ruined the whole meal. It's not a sliding curve. People go, well, I'm not as bad as that person. I'm better than that person. It's not good enough. Don't miss this important point. Some people say that they're fine believing in God. You know, they've looked around and they say, okay, well, you know what, I get it. There, there's a greater being, there's a higher being, there's a big boy upstairs, I'm fine with that. But this Jesus character, yeah, you know, I mean, there, there were probably was a guy named Jesus and he probably did some cool stuff, but son of God, died on the cross, all that. Uh, I, I don't know about all that, but you know what, God? Yeah, I'm good with God. I'm good with the big boy upstairs, right? Anybody know this person? I've got one of them in, in my family circle. Fine with the big boy upstairs really hoping and trying to work with them to understand who Jesus is. Understand that forgiveness for sin comes through nobody else. Accepting God but not accepting Jesus is a huge problem. For there is no other name given among mankind by which we must be saved. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but through me. How many ways? One way. So if you deny that one way, I'm okay with God, but Jesus, yeah, I'm not so sure about Jesus, then you've got a huge problem. Paul was talking to the church in Rome, in Romans 5, 8 through 9, he said, God demonstrates, God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. 
Not cheap talk, not hollow speeches. God demonstrated his love for us. God demonstrated his love for you. And that while you were still in your sin, he sent the son to die on the cross for your sins. That's proof. Demonstrated proof. Paul says, since we have now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? We've been justified. We have been forgiven by the blood of Christ. And there is no other way. John also told us this. The apostle John said, my dear children, I write this to you so that you will not sin. Wouldn't that be great? John says, you know what? I'm writing this to you and my encouragement to you is this. Don't sin. So I'm going to tell you right now, okay, here's my encouragement to y'all, okay, enemy, okay, don't sin anymore. Just stop sinning. Y'all good? All right. Well, we pretty much we can wrap it up and go to lunch. Well, but there's more. He says, but if anybody does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. He is the atoning sacrifice, or some translations say he is the propitiation for our sins. And not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. You see, our forgiveness was not free. The cost of sin, death, could not just be erased. The debt was owed to God and it had to be paid. And it was paid by the death and the blood of Jesus Christ on the cross. We say forgiven, oh, I've been set free. That's true, you have been forgiven and you have been set free, but freedom isn't free. There's a cost to freedom. There's a sacrifice that has to be made for freedom. And Jesus paid that price. This is why God the Father sent Jesus the Son in the flesh for the very purpose to be offered up as a sacrifice for my sin, for your sin, and for the sins of the world. Even the apostle Peter told us this. He says, for you know that it was not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your ancestors. So what was offered for me? What was the price that was paid for me? Peter says, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect, worthy is the lamb who was slain. No higher price could have been paid to redeem us, to buy us back from our sin, to pay the price for the consequence of our rebellion. Are you in Christ? Have you believed in your heart? Have you accepted that God's word is the truth? Have you asked Jesus to forgive you? If you have, then your sins have been forgiven and you have been set free. Free, and that is a hallelujah moment. So now, how, now what do we do? If you believe these things, now what do you do? Well, you live the life that you were set free to live. Galatians 4.3 says this, so also when we were children, we were enslaved under the basic principles of the world. When we were kids, we did bad things. Aren't you glad we're all grown up now? But you know, we're not children anymore. We're not naive little kids anymore. We understand right from wrong far better now than we did back then. And even then, when we were naive children, when we did wrong, we knew that we had done wrong. How much more now, being adults, having grown up or growing older, growing <clears throat> wiser, do we understand right from wrong? Growing in one body, growing in the body of Christ, growing stronger, growing together, learning from God all knowledge and all that truly matters. We're not like little kids anymore. We can't just say, you know, well, the world misled me. It's not good enough anymore. Never was. John 8, 32 says, and you shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. Jesus is the truth. God's word is the truth. That Jesus died on the cross and shed his blood to cover your sins, that's the truth. And it will set you free. But it was a price that was paid for you. So we need to be careful how we live. Living like one who has truly been set free. Like someone that just got out of prison, all charges dismissed. You went into prison for a crime that you committed. 
All the charges have been dismissed and you're set free. How do you live your life? Your punishment has been avoided. Your, your crime, your transgression has been forgiven because the debt was paid by someone else. You were sentenced to the chair. And somebody said, you know what? I'll go to the chair for you. Your charges have been dismissed. You've been set free. How do you live your life when you walk out of that prison? When the doors close behind you and the taxi cabs there waiting to pick you up, how do you live your life? Here's the absurd challenge of being set free. Are you going to return to your life of crime? Can you imagine the mentality of being in that moment and thinking, whew, man, did I skate on that one? I am free to go back and live a life of crime once again. Isn't it absolutely absurd? That's why Paul wrote, or, uh, yeah, Paul wrote to us in Romans. He says, what shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? By no means. We are those who have died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? We have been forgiven. We've been set free. So why would we keep on doing the things that we used to do? Why would we keep on doing the things that Jesus died on the cross to forgive us of? If you've believed in your heart that Jesus is the Son of God who came forth from heaven and lived among us, who performed miracles and gave signs and wonders, that he died on the cross and shed his righteous blood to save us, that his dead body was placed in the tomb and three days later, by his own authority, he took it up again. If you've believed these things, then your sins have been forgiven. You are redeemed. Your debt has been paid by the blood of Christ and reckoned unto your account as righteousness. Not because of anything that you did, other than to have believed in faith all that Jesus did for you. Amen. God has forgiven you. Let me ask this question real quick. God has forgiven you. I want an audible answer here. Do you believe that? We need to. We need to believe it in our heart and it needs to carry into our life that we are forgiven. When you step back and you look at you that you see in the mirror, what deeds of yesterday still haunt you? What words spoken, deeds done, or pains that you brought on somebody else still afflict you in your heart? Do you still see the faces of all the people that you hurt? Are you still aware of the tears of sorrow that you caused? When these memories flood through your mind, do you still feel the shame of your actions, grieved and broken? Do you still remember the you that you used to be? And are you letting that drive your life? What's your coping mechanism? If these things still come back and haunt you, and if they're driving your life, if these things are holding you back from following Jesus to the fullest, I, I could never do that. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not that person. I, I've got all this baggage that I've got with me. Jesus died on the cross for all of it. How do we cope with it? Do we deny it? Do we ignore it? Do we blame others? Do we hide it behind fake smiles? Do we bury it in work or play? Do we blame God? Do we blame ourselves? Do we punish ourselves? Do we hate ourselves? Do we give up on trying to serve the Lord? Are we letting this person that we used to be hold us back. What an amazing thing to understand that God has forgiven you. In fact, I'm gonna push that even one step further. And again, I'm working those voices out here because I'm not hearing a whole lot of coughing. So the flu bug is, is behind us. I wanna hear everybody say, God has forgiven me. One, two, three. God has forgiven me. I want you to believe that. I want you to believe that because if Jesus has forgiven you, you are free indeed. John 8, 31, 32, Jesus was talking. He says, if you continue in my word, then you are truly disciples of mine and you will know the truth and the truth will make you free. So if the son sets you free, you are free indeed. We've got to accept that we are forgiven. We have to know in our knowers that we are forgiven. We need to live like we are forgiven. And here's the thing about forgiven people. Forgiven people, forgive people. There are those around us who have hurt us. 
In the same manner as we hurt the Lord when we sinned against him, yet he has forgiven us, we are called to go out and forgive others. That pa- the end of the passage from Ephesians 4, verses 31 and 32, says, get rid of all bitterness, rage, and anger, outcry, and slander, along with every form of malice. Instead, be kind to each other, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, just as God through Christ has forgiven you. This is part of our DNA. This is part of our makeup. It needs to be real to us that we have been forgiven. And it needs to be part of our life as we go out and forgive others. You see, our sin was not just in the flesh, but in the spirit too. You know, we, we get this idea, and you know, we go back, we look at that original sin that was accredited to Adam. It says Adam committed this sin, and it was always held accountable to Adam. Why was it held accountable to Adam? Because Adam chose to disobey God. You know, we throw things out, you know, well, you know, Eve was deceived. No, I get it, but here's the thing. Adam absolutely chose to disobey God. Not only did he commit the, the act in his flesh of disobeying God, <laughs> But he made, before he actually committed the act in the flesh, first he committed it in his knower, in his spirit, in his will. He chose to reject God's will and place his will on the throne of his life. So in his spirit, he had already disobeyed God. Then he followed through in his flesh. So that's why it's spirit and flesh that rebel against him. Flesh by committing the sin, spirit by choosing to disobey God. And that is true also every time that we reject and rebel against God. When we choose to go out and do things our way, we do them with the words that we speak, the thoughts that we think, the flesh that we live out through, but we choose to do those things in our mind and our will. This is why man, the flesh has been corrupted by the sin, but also our spirit, because we have chosen to disobey God. But praise God that Christ's death on the cross paid that debt in full that was due to the Lord. At the end of all things, with Jesus on the cross, Jesus said this. He that gave him the sour wine, it was right at, right at the end of his life as he hung there on the cross. And he said, it is finished. And bowing his head, he yielded up his spirit. The Lord gave up his body as a sacrifice for us. He yielded up his spirit from the body. Matthew 27, 51 says, at that moment, the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth quaked and the rocks were split. In that moment, everything changed. Our access to the holiness of God was secured through Christ because of his sacrifice. And this is why we have have these verses we're going to talk more about in coming lessons about dying to ourselves and living to Christ. This is why we have to die to ourselves. Not only in the flesh, as this flesh is going to decay, we know that, but we have to sacrifice our will. We have to give up our will. We have to surrender our will to his will to die to self and to live to Christ. His death is then applied to our debt. The debt is then paid. Only when the debt is paid, only when we accept that debt in faith, can our sins truly be forgiven. Somebody will say, well, I've told the Lord that I was real sorry for all the stuff I've done, but you know, that whole you know, you know, believing and receiving and going to church and all that other stuff, you know, I told God, you know, I'm sorry. It's not enough. It doesn't matter without Christ. The debt's still not paid if we haven't accepted his sacrifice in faith. Some will say, well, I focus my whole life on doing good things. I'm a good person. Doesn't matter. Without Christ's death applied to your life, the transgressions, the trespasses of our sins are still equated to us. To receive the blessing, to accept that propitiation, we have to accept Christ's payment on the cross in faith. People say, you know, well, I've heard these things and I understand these things. I know what you're talking about. I know them in my head. That's great. Do you believe them in your heart? We must allow our will to be surrendered to his will, our spirit to be surrendered to his spirit. And what does that look like? When we truly follow through on that, well, it looks like love. That's what it looks like. Romans 12, 1, 2 says, Therefore I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God. We need to give up ourselves, our time, our efforts, our energy, to present ourselves a sacrifice to the Lord. I've told people this because this is one of my working verses for my life. I don't always feel like going out and serving the Lord. Sometimes I'm busy. Sometimes I'm tired. And God says, yeah, I got this thing I want you to go do. Sometimes you have to present yourself. Sometimes you've got to pick yourself up by the bootstraps and get yourself out the door to serve the Lord. 
But when you do, God will use your time and your efforts and your energy and provide for you everything that you need. This also in Romans 13, eight, uh, verses 8 through 10, the debt we need to continue to pay. Paul says, Owe nothing to anyone except to love one another. For he who loves his neighbor has fulfilled the law. For this, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet. And if there is any other commandment, it is summed up in this, saying you shall love your neighbor as yourself. All the law is wrapped up in that. If we would just love our neighbor as we love ourselves, love, love does no wrong to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. Someone says, all right, well, how did I get that debt? Why is that placed on me? What did I ever do? These people don't even like me. Why would I go out there and share Jesus with them? Well, our understanding of this begins with the understanding of men like the Apostle Paul and men like Billy Graham. Who, as we mentioned earlier today, died on February 21st at the age of 99. According to the Billy Graham Institute, over the, life of, over the course of his life, Billy Graham spread the gospel, reached uh, 2.2 billion people with the gospel between his music, or between his uh, TV ministries and, and uh, the outreaches he had. Over 3.2 million people are credited to having received or accepted the message of, of Jesus Christ from him. You wanna talk about people that are willing to go out and serve the Lord and reach the lost? Guys like Paul, the apostle, great example. In our own time, we've got guys like Billy Graham. Billy once wrote, I have not written my own epitaph and I'm not sure I should. Whatever it is, I hope it will be simple and that it will point people not to me, but to the one I served. Men like Paul and Billy are examples of followers of Jesus who were moved by the Holy Spirit and recognized that in their life of forgiveness, they needed to go out and share that message with others. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 9, 16, yet when I preach the gospel, I have no reason to boast, but I am obligated to preach. In fact, Paul says, woe to me if I do not preach the gospel. Paul says, I can't help myself. I have got to go out and preach the gospel. Reverend Graham was another guy that got that. Billy said, God has given us two hands, one to receive with and the other to give with. We are not cisterns made for holding. We are channels made for sharing. What a great gift has been given to us with the mercy of Jesus Christ has been poured into our lives. Let you be a cup that runs over. We have received, let us give. Paul said, I do not want you to be unaware, brothers and sisters, that I planned many times to come to you in order that I might have a harvest among you, just as I have had among the other Gentiles. Paul said, I am obligated both to Greeks and to non-Greeks, both to the wise and to the foolish. That is why I'm so eager to preach the gospel also to you who are in Rome. Paul said, I am obligated to reach out to the wise and the unwise, the learned and the unlearned, to every man with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Paul said, I have become all things to all people. Whatever it takes, Paul said, that I could share the gospel with just one more person that they might know Jesus Christ and their sins be forgiven. Romans 1.16, Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. To Jew first and then to the Greek. I'm not ashamed of the gospel. I'm not ashamed to go out there. I'm not afraid to go out there and tell somebody the gospel of Jesus Christ. I don't care what they might think of me. I care about what they think about God and what they know about the Lord Jesus Christ and whether they have chosen, chosen to accept him or not. Now, if you're hearing this, I want you to know that you just happen to be the audience here before you today because I'm preaching this solely to myself. Because I need to grow in this area just as well. In fact, all the more because of where I stand, that I not be ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ and be committed as Paul was committed. Woe to me if I do not share the gospel. Billy Graham said, man has two great spiritual needs. One is forgiveness and the other is goodness. Why were they so determined to share the gospel with others? Because they were followers of Jesus Christ. Because they truly were seeking to follow Jesus because they truly understood that Paul and Billy did what it meant to be a disciple of the Lord, to be like the Lord, to understand that he was their master and their mentor and to grow to be like him and to do the things that he did and to live a life in the way that he lived his life and to share the message of truth with the world around them as he did. They got it, do we? 
We have this one debt that's still hanging out over our life. We've been forgiven, we've been set free, but we have this one debt in that verse I gave a little while ago to love one another. That one debt to love one another is paid out day by day by day in every day that the Lord gives us. To love one another as Jesus loved us. Reverend Graham said this, God proved his love on the cross when Jesus Christ hung and bled and died. It was God saying to the world, I love you. Remember, Billy said, he wants your fellowship and he has done everything possible to make it a reality. He has forgiven your sins at the cost of his own dear son. He has given you his word and the priceless privilege of prayer and of worship. And we can't take that for granted. We can't take what a privilege it is to be the children of God for granted. We know that God loves us because he had already given Jesus to us, even before we knew who he was. God demonstrates his love. God proves his love for us. Jesus said, follow me. Are we willing to follow? Jesus said, love your neighbor as you love yourself. Are we willing to do that? Do you love enough yourself enough to save yourself? And the answer is yes, because you're sitting here today. You heard that message. You researched that message of the gospel. You believed that message of the gospel enough to spare yourself. Now we're told, we're called, we are commanded to go out and love our neighbors enough to share it with them. Jesus said, a new commandment I give to you, love one another as I have loved you. What did Jesus withhold from us on the cross? Nothing. So what will I withhold from my neighbor who does not yet know the Lord? Reverend Graham said, being a Christian is more than an instantaneous conversion. It is a daily process whereby you grow to be more and more like Christ. Make sure of your commitment to Jesus Christ and seek to follow him every day. Don't be swayed by the false values and goals of this world, but put Christ and his will first in everything that you do. Slide up here shows Billy Graham walking into heaven at the pearly gates. Shows St. Peter standing there and says, Billy Graham, millions of people here want to thank you. Here's a thought. When you get to heaven, is anybody going to be waiting at the gates to thank you? Got some key points I want you to take out of here today. Number one, you have been forgiven. You are free, but freedom wasn't free. Jesus paid your debt with his own flesh on the cross. Recognize and remember your savior. Number two, you are free. You have been forgiven. Quit living your life in the prison of your past sins. Live like you've been set free. Jesus has set you free, you are free indeed. Now live the life he died to save you for. Don't let your past hold you back. Boldly move forward in the name of Christ. Number three, living that life means following Jesus. That life of freedom is a life that we've been called to, a life to follow Jesus as disciples of Jesus Christ, as followers of Jesus Christ. That's the life that we've been called to live. Jesus said, if you love me, you will obey me. And how many times did Jesus tell us to go out, share the gospel? How much, what a great commandment that was for us to be Christ-like to the world around us. Forgiven people forgive people. Forgive those who wrong you. Forgive those who mock you. Forgive those who hate you. As Christ offered up his life so that we could be forgiven. Even Jesus on the cross said, Father, forgive them. They do not know what they do. They don't understand what they're doing, the Lord said. Forgive them. When people go out there and they wrong you, if you go out there and you are so bold as to obey the commandments of Jesus and share the gospel with people out there, there are going to be some people out there that are going to challenge you, insult you, embarrass you, mock you, put you down. Let us adopt the same attitude that Christ had. Father, forgive them. Let's adopt the same attitude that Stephen had as the stones were crashing into his body. Father, forgive them. They don't understand what they're doing. We are his ambassadors on earth. This isn't just a challenge for us for that we should be doing something. This is a commandment that we must do. To do any less is to lessen our payment in love to them and to the Lord. Billy Graham gave you this encouragement. He said, spend more time in study and in prayer. 
one of the greatest evangelists, the greatest evangelist our time has ever known. And this is his encouragement to you. Spend more time in study and in prayer. That is the secret of successful evangelism. Worked for Billy. Worked for the glory of the Lord. It'll work for us. Paul said, woe to me if I do not preach the gospel. We have this mission statement we threw out there a while back. Intentionally influence every relationship with the gospel. That's our mission statement here at Wellspring Bible Fellowship. We want to intentionally influence every relationship with the gospel. I hope that we are doing that. The gospel is a message of forgiveness. The gospel is a message of love. The gospel is a story of why Jesus Christ died on the cross for our sins. Now as followers of Jesus Christ, as those who have been forgiven, as those who have been set free, we've been told, God told us, Jesus told us, he encouraged us, go out there and share the gospel of Jesus Christ with others. It's not reserved just for guys like Paul and Billy. It was a commandment for anybody who has called upon the name of the Lord and been saved. For all of us whose sins have been forgiven to go out there and share the gospel with others. It's not a special gifting just for this person or that. And your casual encounters as you meet people out and about in the community, taking the opportunity to share the gospel of Jesus Christ with them. And not just in a casual, you know, oh, you know, well, I'm a follower of Jesus Christ. I go to Wellspring Bible Fellowship. You want to come sometime? Now take it a little bit deeper than that and actually explain to them, you know, hey, I'm, do you know who Jesus is? Have you met the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ? I'm not talking door-to-door salesmanship here. I'm not talking standing on the street corner with a bullhorn. I'm just talking as you're in the line and you're getting your coffee, as you're getting your truck filled up at the gas station, as, as you're interacting with people at your school or at your work, at the lunch table, as you take time to pray before your meal publicly and, and somebody looks at you and are like, you know, I'm just honoring my Lord. Do you know Jesus? And taking time to explain to them who he is and why they need to know him and finishing it off with something like this. Would you, have you accepted the Lord as your savior? If you haven't, I'd love to pray with you right now. Because at the end of the day, a fully uh, presented gospel of Jesus Christ to somebody finishes up with an invitation to join. Isn't that what Paul told his people? He said, accept the Lord. Isn't that what Billy told people? Accept the Lord. It's more just about the presenting, but it's about the offering, saying, are you ready? And if not, what can I do to help you? Taking next steps with them. Will we? Would you? Will you? As members of Wellspring Bible Fellowship, and for those joining here at home, you're not off the hook. Will you intentionally influence every relationship with the gospel of Jesus Christ? If not, why why wouldn't we? Why aren't we? We need to. We have to. We must. Woe to us if we do not preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. Let's close. Father God, we come to you in prayer. Lord, we come to you in humble humiliation, submittiveness, submissiveness. Lord, recognizing that we have not been doing as well as we could or should for the glory of your kingdom. Lord Jesus, you died on the cross for our sins so that we could be set free. Free to live a life to serve you. A life we dare not expect, a a life we certainly did not deserve. And yet you died on the cross so that we could be set free. So that we who are unrighteous could be called righteous. So that we who are unworthy could be called worthy. So that we who had no reason to have access to the heavenly places have assuredness that we will be in heaven when we pass from these bodies. If we have accepted the gospel of Jesus Christ. Lord, our sins have been forgiven and we have been set free so that we can go out and we can live free lives to share the gospel with others. Somebody took the time to share the gospel with me, Lord, and I accepted it and I believed it, and here I am. Lord, each one of us hearing that has got the same statement. Somebody shared the gospel. Somewhere we heard the message of the truth, and we believed it, we received it, we accepted it, and we wholeheartedly back it. Lord, help us now to move forward with that next step of faithfulness, to be a true follower, a full follower of Jesus Christ. Lord, to follow your example to go out into the world, to go out amongst the sick, to go out into the the people who have not accepted the gospel of Jesus Christ and to share with them why they need to know you. Why it is that their sins are going to separate them from you eternally because in their flesh they have lived out sin, in their mind, in their will they have chosen to disobey you. 
So Lord, we need to die to self. We need to put the old ways aside and follow you, to lean on you, to trust you, to obey you. And Lord, to share your love with a world that desperately needs you. Lord, to you be all praise and all glory who paid the price so that we could be free. Amen.